You cannot give Vince McMahon a blank piece of paper and ask him to write a show. Mm -hmm. he, he can't do it. I, if he was sitting in that chair, I would tell him, you can't do it, and if you can, go ahead and do it. I dare you to do it. He cannot do it. But let me tell you what the challenge was, and, and I don't want to speak for Ed, but it was always my challenge, okay? We worked so hard on the show that it, it almost became a game where I, I know my goal was to write such a good, solid show that there is not one thing that Vince can change. Mm -hmm. That that was the goal because th just you know. But man, Vince's genius was you'd hand him the show, and you got to understand when we went to his house, we had a formatted show. Yeah. What match went first? What went? It, it was, was ready. To, it was ready. It was ready, ready to go. It could have. It could have been handed out at a right. production. But but here's he where the genius would come in, and 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 and. To, to the last day that I worked with him, it blew me away. We'd go over it, we'd pick it apart, we'd pick it apart some more. We're thinking he, he ain't gonna touch this. Mm -hmm. He ain't. <laughs> there's nothing he could change. Man, there, I, I don't know how he did it. He did it because he's Vince. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But every time he would pick these little things out. Vince used to love to call them nuances. Mm -hmm. He would pick these little things out, and he would make a great idea even better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and every week I would wind up leaving his house kicking myself. Yeah. Why didn't I think it out? Yeah. But that's where the genius is. Just, just his insight to, to envision the angle in his mind and be able to pick out the smallest little details. But to start from scratch, I, I, I don't think he can do that. But to, 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 take to book a show, he yes. could easily book a show that he could promote. Right, you know, book a card, come up with the best eight matches right. that would that would do a yeah. dynamite show. But in terms of in terms of okay, segment one, we're starting with a pre-tape in the back with Hunter and Batista. Then we're going to a match in the ring. You know what I mean? And coming up with the flow of a right. show right. and what comes where, as far as starting with a blank piece of paper. I think that's what you're right. saying. Right. Yeah. And I don't mean to speak for you no, because no, you no, spoke yeah. for me before. Right. No, that's but, that's, you know, that's what I'm saying. But but again, the, the genius was yeah. being able to take those little details, and that that's what WCW didn't have a clue about. Yeah. Know? I mean, and that's where Vince he'd look at. Uh, it, 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 it to this day it amazes me. No. Now you guys are taking your scripts to Vince McMahon. You've got a show on Tuesday or Wednesday that could go on Monday. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if Vince he said, you know what, just do the show, it's that ready. And yet, as you said, he always found something to change. Now, did you guys in the scripts, were you following his vision for what he told you in the big picture he wanted, or were you guys just week to week actually telling him where his company would be going with we, all of his main characters? We would tell him where yeah. his company was going. Okay, I mean, good. So now Vin, Vince never Vince never gave us an outline or never said this needs to have this. All, all he used to really care about, to be honest with you, was we would get to his house on uh, you know Wednesday or Thursday, or whatever, with the shows. And I mean, all he was really concerned was was what's Austin doing. Mm -hmm. What's the, the top rocking? story? The, yep. the top He's always had that rep. Top Absolutely. Guys are his main but, it, you know, but he, he, I mean, we guided those top stories. I mean, we, you know, we kind of, you know, drove the ship. And as far as everything underneath, I mean, I don't want to say Vince didn't care because he he did. But, I mean, he basically. He wasn't letting that rent space. He knew where the money, he knew where the money right. was made. And he yeah, knew it was exactly. important to have yes. the undercard work. But, but I think he, he trusted us to the point yeah. with he knew that we would take care of the undercard. Right. To the point where he could focus his attention on the upper, on, on on the main event. So Vince McMahon didn't tell you in October, this is what I want WrestleMania's main event. No, to be. what we would do is we would sit down in, you know, April. What's WrestleMania next year going yeah. to be? And we would lay out the main events for what we saw the pay per views were going to be as as a as a group leading up to WrestleMania and how would we get to WrestleMania? So right then and there, a year out, we had an idea of the storyline, but the, the thing that was great about working with Vince and about the trust that he placed in us was because he knew that we were the ones, after we left his house, we were the ones that would go off together and wrap our heads around it and bang our heads against the wall and figure out every aspect of what works, what doesn't work about this. Yeah. And we would quite often come back in the next week and say, you know what, we need to change up our way of thinking, this is why. Instead of heading towards this six months from now, leading to WrestleMania, we need to go this way. And he was very open to that. Um, because a lot of stuff would change on the fly and would yeah. be like, well, this really is what we need to do this week. Now, you plan out 12 months, but you're saying that was a working plan, but it changed or yes. did it? Did you ever 
Did you ever have a match six months ahead on a pay per view that you had planned out, and you actually six months later were there? Did that sometimes happen, or almost never? Not, not, not. No. Not, but not, but yet yeah. it helped to have that. You Absolutely. needed something. Probably to work the only towards. thing was yeah, the Survivor you, you, Series you, tournament. But we he, knew we were he, doing. But here's the key too. Here's the key, Wade. It, it's we'd have that, but the bottom line is Ed and I would listen to the people and adjust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When Mick Foley became the WWE, that wasn't nobody's plans. The people were begging for it. Yeah. So I mean, that's why you couldn't stick to a game plan because the key was listening to the people and giving them what they wanted. And that's being outside of the wrestling bubble. Right. Yeah. If we were in the bubble, it would have been, well, it seems like this is what they want, but they don't really know what they want. What's the, what's the idea that wrestling fans would remember that you guys came up with, that you only came up with because you were outside the bubble, and you kind of had to fight and persuade Vince McMahon to go with it? Was there either a general theme direction, maybe not even a specific match, or maybe a specific match or angle where Vince gave one of those looks? So well, I, I'll tell you what. what I, one, one thing, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to jump yet, but this was without you. I, I had one one major disagreement with Vince that, that almost got into a yelling match. I mean, and it was like the only time. And I'll never forget it because we were going into a Survivor Series match between The Undertaker and Steve Austin. I don't know if you remember that or not. Yeah. But it was going to be in New York City. Okay. SummerSlam. SummerSlam. That was that. Yeah, that was there. Okay. Yeah. Both wrestlers, yes. you know, were kind of red hot and at their peak. Okay. Yep. Well, the story goes that behind the scenes, okay, Undertaker and Austin were friends, mm -hmm. and Undertaker and Austin wanted to have a baby face match because they mutual were friends. Mutual respect, mutual props. Mutual this is respect. on air or behind the scenes? This, this is behind the behind scenes. Behind the scenes, they're good friends. Yeah. So they want to almost portray this in front of the cameras where they wanted the angle to end with Undertaker drinking beer with Austin. Yeah. And my gut instinct was, Vince, this is New York Madison Square Garden. Okay? We've built these characters in such a way that they want to see these two guys kill each other. I mean, they're both strong characters. You don't know what the outcome is going to be. There's got to be heat, 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 heat. But the one thing about Vince was and he did this a lot of times, and I disagree with him, okay? Whether or not the talent was right or wrong, he always went with what they wanted to do. The top Ultimately. talent. The top talent. Yes. The, very the top, top talent. Three, always four, always yeah. went with what they wanted to do. And because Taker and Austin wanted to have a babyface match, Vince went with that. And you had to make the best of it then? Well, I, I remember a week getting into a shadow match with him. Yeah. You know, because he kept saying, Vince, what's wrong? And I kept no. saying, Th this whole thing is wrong, Vince. It it's horrible. I yelled at him. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. And, and I'll never forget Madison Square Garden. Taker and Austin went out and they had their babyface match. Nobody responded, and they were both disappointed after their match, and they couldn't understand yeah. why they got that response. Uh -huh. Now, and, did and Vince realize that kind of what you said was going to happen? Whether he realized it or not, he would never admit it. Okay. But again, but the next pay-per-view, we, we began working the Undertaker, Austin, Kane angle, and the Undertaker was healing by them because we were heading towards the, the ministry right. at that point. But again, keep in mind now, that wasn't, see, a lot of people think that, you know, when Ed Farrar and Vince Russo sat down, they wrote a show that Ed Farrar and Vince Russo liked. Yeah. It, it don't work that way. Okay. We, we knew what the people wanted. We knew a society. So like with, with Undertaker in Austin, Every time we had a ha we we had a a raw or you know every time there was an audience we would go out there and listen to the people yeah. and just by listening to the people I knew they they wanted there's no right. friendship here they wanted these guys to kill each other now this might people who have followed things you have said about your philosophy might be surprised at this disagreement on what side of it you were on because you were a proponent of baby faces and heels are passe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So reconcile this. How is this different than you saying, oh, people don't want to see good and bad anymore. They want to see kind of No, no, new I, I don't mean that. I, I mean, I mean when, when, when I started, baby faces and heels meant baby faces can only act this way yep. and heels can only act this way. Yep. It doesn't mean that, you know, w w when they get in a match, you know, you, you, you build a heat and they go, it means there's a lot of shades of gray. Yeah. But I mean, you know, literally when I started, there were the rules for the baby faces and the rules for the heels. You know, we took those rules and we threw them at the window. But the attitude era. This is when it's all about fun. Right. Building into the attitude. Right. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, you, you still got to guide it in such a way that there's a person they root for yeah. and a person that they root against. Yeah. But you need to do that in a realistic way. <laughs> way yeah so it's a baby face by default because this is this is a you know the way society is today we're in a society today where 
the, the concept of the hero has been tarnished so much to the point where the anti-hero is almost more popular than the hero. Austin wasn't a hero. He was an anti-hero. Yeah. He went against all the rules, but that he still was a babyface, even though he didn't do traditional babyface things. There are some people that define babyface as the old school definition, right down to practically wearing the white hat, white yep. boots, white trunks, smile, bing, when they smile, and the heel, you know, behaving a different way and looking a different way. Now, it's completely different. If you brought out a traditional old school babyface, yep. you'd get booed out of the building. Well, and they're, they're trying that now with yeah. John Cena, in a way. Because, yeah. I mean, John Cena on television right now, it's like they're trying some is new things. Is that really what they're doing right he now? He is out there talking about his chain gang, He's got, and I mean, by the time people see this DVD, maybe they'll have got a completely different direction. Are the chain gang direction. like his Cena maniacs? Are they, yes, they, exactly. It's a very, it's a very Hulkamaniac angle. It's wholesome. He says, "I don't start fights, but if you bring it, then we'll fight." It's, it's a different, it's a different approach. There again, it's, it's that cyclical. It's trying new things, and and it's going to be interesting to see if it, if it sticks or not. Now, are they trying to heal him with that, or are they trying to nope. make him a baby? Face? They want to make him baby face, but the the risk with it, and I want to talk about Steve Austin in depth because it's such a fascinating, uh, industry changing era, the Steve Austin era, um, it, more so than the NWO, I think, because the Austin thing stuck. With Cena, the, the goal is go back in time because we've already seen the Attitude Era, and so now they're trying to make him wholesome. But the, the risk is our 20-year-old's going to like a guy who's appealing to 10-year-olds, and that's going to be the risk. Yeah. Now, let's. T I want to ask one more question and then get on Steve Austin because you were touching on good stuff. On the flip side, was there an angle or an idea that you presented to Vince that he went with against his better judgment and he proved to be right? that you learn from? Was, was there a concept? <laughs> we, we, we look bad not coming up with something. Oh, right man. You block uh, those out of your mind. No, uh, no, we'll think of something. Oh, I, I got the, it. The, I got the, it. I got, I got it. it. I got it. Okay. Remember your you head. first. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 I forget what it was, the, the dog pound match. Because he was, he was complaining about that yeah. for moment one. Yeah. And we thought it was, I mean, and we, we had, we had our issues about the whole, uh, Boss man cooking up Al Snow's dog. Uh, wait, that, uh, you were in favor of it or against it? Well, this was in favor. I was against okay. it. I was against it. No other reason than the fact that I've got two little pugs. I've yeah. got two little dogs. And I just, me personally, if I was a fan watching the show, I would have went, oh. It would have yeah. been, and, and that was a, a Vince term. That's not good heat. That's disgusting heat. <laughs> yep. And that's one of the terms he said. And that was the kind of thing. So that was where I was against that. But I still thought the dog pound match still could have been interesting. The problem was, I think that it was a little bit of, uh, you know, just execution wise. And I'm not putting it on the guys. Yeah. I just mean just the way the whole match came together. It wasn't as well thought out, and that's as much on us as it is on anybody else. And what was your mine was on? You know, w w DX was hot at the time. Yeah. I mean, on you know, uh, uh, it was Sean Hunter in China, and I mean, they were hot. You know. And I'll never forget, you know, sitting at Vince's table and him telling me that he wanted to start these New Age Outlaws with Billy Gunn and, and Jesse James. Yep. And I looked at him like, what are you out of your mind? Yep. I mean, I, 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 I did not see that at all. But yep. he was like, no, nah, Vince, I'm telling you, there's something about these two guys. If we put them together. To... So I was like, all right, you know, let's do it. And I mean, sure enough. But man, the first time he threw that out at me, I, I looked at him like he had two heads. But uh, I mean, you know, by the time we put that group together, I mean, it was it was phenomenal. All right, Steve Austin, Stone Cold Steve Austin, changed the wrestling industry because at the time, the NWO in WCW was huge. It was it had revolutionized wrestling. There was this heel group. The circumstances of the moment were just incredible. WCW is so far ahead of WWE at this point, it almost seems hopeless. Then this guy, Steve Austin, comes around. They settle them with the grab bag gimmick, the, the ring, the ringmaster, which is, uh, you guys maybe can talk about this. There were prefabbed gimmicks that were the result of brainstorming sessions, that, and one of them was a the ringmaster, and they just applied it to Steve Austin. Mm -hmm. And all of that changed. He broke through it. Talk about the Steve Austin phenomenon, especially your impression of him and your involvement in that evolution of a character who became, next to Hulk Hogan, the most successful money-drawing wrestler in this country's history. Can I throw two cents in before you go? Because at the let's time first, when let's first plug your book. Well, <laughs> we don't have to plug my book. Ed I brought book. Dark, where did I get this at? Uh, at edferrar.com. What's the name of the book? It's called Dark Consequences. Can you tell us a little bit? Okay. No. Okay. Uh, that's only, an Easter egg. You only we'll one. Um, as a fan, let me just throw it out because that was right before I came in. But at the time, I was a huge wrestling fan. Uh, 
work in indies, watching as much as I could. I had bought Prime Star Cable just so I could get ECW programming from the East Coast because I was living in Southern California at the time. Um, but uh, and and Steve Austin was a guy who, uh, when I was watching WCW, and this was when WCW was starting to come up and just pre NWO, but when they were starting to get their stuff together, and I always looked at Steve Austin. I said, this guy at the time the way I put it was this guy's going to be the next Ric Flair mm -hmm. in terms of the guy who had it the mm -hmm. guy who had the charisma and who could back it up and who could go in the ring and who could go out there and look good against anybody and make anybody look good um, and when Austin came into the WWE first of all, WWF first of all I was ecstatic that finally in my mind he had made it to the show yeah. Um, because me being a lifelong WWF fan, growing up in the Northeast, that was all I knew, all I wanted, all I watched. And then when I saw him brought in as the ringmaster, I just held my head. I couldn't believe that they were going to blow this one. They assigned him, Ted DiBiase, to be his, his spokesperson right. because he couldn't cut a promo according right. to the powers that be at that time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. That, let, let me add a little insight yeah. to that. I, yeah. I, I was, I never saw Austin at ECW. I mean, I didn't, mm -hmm. but I was. I, or I WCW? Liked, I saw him at I was a Sunny okay. Steve Austin fan. And you, you mm -hmm. were in WWF when Austin was first yes. there. Let's yes, set and, that and I was a, uh, I was a stunning Steve Austin fan with the long blonde hair. I, I always liked him, you know. And I'll never forget, you know, at the time before I started really writing the television, I would write a lot of the promos for the guys. So I would go to Vince and I would say, you know, Vince, you know, what do you want this character to be or what do you want that character to be to get a feel for how to write the promos. And I'll never forget when, uh, you know, Austin started as the ringmaster. The first time I heard the ringmaster, and, and I'm not even lying to you, <laughs> I thought it was a cir circus gimmick. I, I yes. didn't even well, get... that's what you said. I, I was expecting him to come out with the top I didn't get the ring... Ma I didn't no, no, get... No, no, yeah, no, no, I'm, no, I'm no, thinking no. that, really. I mean, the first time it was told to me, I'm like, you know... I was thinking but anyway, the Spider-Man villain, yeah, the ringmaster. Yeah, but anyway, I, I remember saying to Vince, you know, Vince, what, what, what do you want me to do for, for Steve Austin's character? Yeah. And I remember him looking me dead in the eye and him <coughs> saying to me, Vince, he, he, he's never to speak, and if he does, <laughs> he's only to speak in a monotone. Okay? So now the thing was, I had to go to the next TV and work with Austin. Yeah. And, I, and I had to tell him this. I, you know, I said, you know, Steve, this is what Vince wants, and, you know, I got to be honest with you, at that moment, you know, he was bursting at the seams because inside was Stone Cold Steve Austin, yep. but he did it. I, I mean, he was a professional, and, and as wrong as it felt, he did it, but I'll never forget the, the, the first breakthrough, and I mean, I'll never forget it was... You know, it was just it was just another raw. It was no big deal. But we put Austin on headsets, mm -hmm. and the minute he put on those headsets, and I listened to him, I was like, "That's it, man." I mean, that is it. You know, the and, and I remember, you know, him walking through the curtain, and yeah. you know, he at that point it was always, "How'd I do, Vince? How'd I do? How'd I do?" And I just looked at him. I said, "Steve, that's it." I mean, yeah. you know, th that's all you needed because was his, that opportunity. His confidence was shot at this point. Absolutely. In WCW, yeah. right. he was the Hollywood Blondes with Brian Pillman. Right. Mm -hmm. They were a hot act. Steve Austin, as U.S. champion, was cutting really good promos, and nobody who mattered, who had power, was taking notice because of the, the politics and the power structure. Right. He wasn't elevated by Dusty Rhodes. He was right. kept down. Right. Then he gets fired by Bischoff in right. one of the most infamous moves by a leader ever because he wasn't marketable quote from Eric Bischoff, he wasn't right. marketable. Then he goes to ECW and he's so mad. There's so much anger pent right. up. He goes nuts and he starts doing these imitations and he starts He was one of the first guys to do the Hogan, one of the first one of the boys to do a Hogan impression. He did Hogan and he yep. did Bischoff. And those were yep. the two powers that he felt held him back. That got, that just inspired him and he got his confidence back and people are praising him who were ECW fans and then all of a sudden he goes to the WWF and did Vince McMahon not see this? Did he not? L had he not seen let, me, let me make one thing. First of all, people don't understand this. Yes. Vince never watched ECW. Yep. V Vince couldn't tell you one single person in ECW. Never watched it. <coughs> but let me tell you this when it comes to Steve Austin, okay? Credit goes to nobody but Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. And Paul Heyman Period. would be the first to say that. I, mm -hmm. All we did was put him in right situation. Yep. Okay. Right. But I am telling you, he was professional. He, do, he, he did exactly what Vince wanted, but when he was given that one opportunity,
he ran there, with there, it. Were, there is nobody to give credit, not Vince, not me, no. nobody but Steve Austin. Now, the headset thing, how long was that before the King of the Ring, Austin 316, is born? Speaking? Probably about three weeks to a month. Mm -hmm. Now, how planned out? To the best of your knowledge, was, was uh, the bro, speech. Bro, I, I got to be Talk honest about with the T-shirt. Well, I, I'll tell you about a couple of things. Yeah. I, were you there for this? No, that okay, was right before me. Th th these are some good stories, though, and I hate to do all the talking. But oh, they, that's okay, I'm stories, used to it. You know? I'll plug your book again. Okay, plug your book again. But Maybe there's I'll a couple of things here. I'll never forget the Night of King of the Ring, okay? Ed wasn't there. So as far as promos and everything went, I was doing everything, okay? And... Ed can tell you, I always work with tunnel vision. I got tunnel, if, if I'm working on something, it's tunnel vision, it's tunnel vision, it's tunnel vision. So I remember Austin coming up to me and saying, Vince, I want to run this promo by you. So I said, okay, Austin, but I was, Steve, but I was thinking about something else. Yep. And he's giving me the promo, giving me the promo, and in the promo I hear Austin 316. Yep. And, and I'm, I got tunnel vision, I'm doing something else, yep. you know? So, you know, he went out there and he cut the promo, and it was, we'll get into the rock in a minute, but as soon as I heard Austin 316... Now, did Vince McMahon and did you... Wait a minute. No. Let, let, okay, let, okay. Let, so let, 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 story. Okay. You'll, you'll get a kick gotcha. out of this. You'll get a kick out of this. As soon as he said, I'm, you know, Austin 316 says, I just, you know... I just said, that's it, man. Yeah. That is it. Okay? I ran back to Titan Tower on Monday. Okay? And I remember the Raw magazine. We were like in the second or third issue. I immediately got a picture of Austin for the cover, black and white, grainy, and we highlighted the blood. And the headline was Austin 316, because I knew, I knew. And, you know, at that time, Vince had approved all the covers. Mm -hmm. So I took this. I was so excited about it. I ran over at the television studio where it was, and I showed him, and he stopped, and he goes, Vince, what's this Austin 316? And I was like, Vince, oh. wait, no, I was like, Vince, did, did you not hear the promo yesterday? I said, Vince, this is it. Yeah. Th this is gold. And this is Monday afternoon, just the next day? Uh, either the next day, a couple probably. days after, yeah. you know, a couple days after. I, 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 see, yeah, I said, Vince, this is it, you know? And he looked at me, he says, Vince, I don't get it, I don't like it, take it off. Did, did Austin, did he get permission to do a post-match promo as Jake Roberts was walking to the back, or did he almost improvise that when he went, Jake's walk, he beats Jake, or whatever happened, he's walk, Jake's walking to the back, Austin goes up and just takes over the show, basically. Was that part of it, were you aware that he was actually going to cut a post-match promo? Yes, I was. Okay, so yeah. that, that, yes. that, that's... Because yes. he had run over yes. the promo beforehand. Yes. With him. But it was, I mean, it, yeah. just, it, it just blew me away, because, you know, like Steve I said, when, when, yeah. when the words came out of his mouth, it... I, I knew. I mean, I, I, the T-shirts, the slogan. I mean, I, I knew it was gold, and Vince I, I, still wasn't getting it. Because I, I, I have to confess something. Because Steve Austin, and I've never said this before, and I don't think he'd care now. When he was in, he, right when he went to ECW, he was out of WCW. He was frustrated. I did a long interview with him. It was in one of the Pro Wrestling Torture books, and we kept in touch a little bit. And it was a couple days before King of the Ring. He's on the phone with me, and I've got my notes at home. I keep every note I have, and I've got it. And someday. If I can have his permission, I'm going to go and take my chicken scratch notes out. And he's telling me his plans. Austin 316, he's brainstorming it with me on yeah, the phone, yeah. saying, Vince won't let me talk, yeah. but I want to talk, and I've got this plan. Yeah. And I'm going to go out there, and he starts telling me how I don't care if they approve it or not, this is what I'm going to do with the pay-per-view. And his plan was, whether he got approval or not, he was going to do it. And apparently he tried to get approval, right. and it was like, go for it. And I just remember thinking, because I mean, I was a cheerleader for him because I knew what he could do yeah and, and I in in his mind he's like I have to grab it I have that's to take it, it exactly. myself exactly that's it that and yep. nobody gave it. I mean I don't want to say nobody gave it to him because Vince did give him the air time yep. but I mean you talk about a guy that grabbed it he I knew mean, he went from having no confidence in WCW even though he was doing good work right. to having fun in ECW not knowing it's my future in Japan right where you don't talk there's no promos he was trying to decide should I go to ECW Japan because WWF's not returning my calls right Finally, he goes mm -hmm. to ECW, then he gets to WWF, they won't let him talk, he's even more frustrated, but he's confident, and then he comes up with it, and it changed the business, and that was a case where Vince McMahon doesn't get credit for it, and you're not taking credit no, for it, no, that's no. something that happened, Yeah, it just happened. Yeah. But, now, but, you gotta understand, he was smart enough to pull it off, Yes. not, not everybody can pull that off, yeah. that conversation he had with you, yeah. he knew exactly <laughs> what he was going to do, right. yeah. when he was going to do it, and nobody was going to keep him down, yeah. so I mean, he, he, he was smart enough to be able to pull that off. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's a perfect example of what we hear so frequently about how, you know, when you have the, the, the boys talking about, uh, I, I didn't get a push, he's getting a push, I'm not getting uh -huh. a push, and it's just, you know, it's, and, and it's true that 
you know, the, the, in the wrestling business today, it's not about getting a push. People don't get pushes. They get opportunities. Yep. And if they take the ball, run with it, and deliver, yep. they will get more opportunities. If they don't, if they fumble, yep. if they drop the ball, if they end up dropping it and kicking it you know, for 10 years, they're not going to get more opportunities. And Austin, Austin was, was a guy right. yep. who took that ball, ran it across Ran it, ran it in for the touchdown, and that was it. And he didn't think he had anything to lose at this point. He knew he could do he more didn't than have he was being given to lose. the opportunity yeah, to, to because that gimmick was saddled on him. was one of those stereotypes, and he had to break that mold, and he did. And that glass yeah. break, it's just it's so apropos to what he did. Mm-hmm. Now, once Austin 316 takes off, fans made it a phenomenon. They're bringing signs, Austin 316. Mm-hmm. It clicks because, you know, Jake Roberts deserves credit for this because mm-hmm. Austin was, you know, he was a heel, but fans were cheering him, and Austin called out Jake on what he felt was, you know, uh, using Bible terminology in a way that he felt was twisted and not genuine, whatever, and he went with it. And then there were some, people might have been sensitive to it. Was there any concern at that point, at that moment, about using something from the Bible in that kind of a hardcore, edgy way? Was that a concern that I'll was brought you. up? No, I mean, no. I mean, no. Yeah. It's just, you know, I, I Jerry Jarrett was offended by it. He told me that. Yeah, you know, I mean, he was like, that's that's blasphemous. It was his word to me about that gimmick, that phrase. Um, again, it's it was listening to the people, yeah. and like you said, w- w- once they started with the songs, yeah. they want it. We're going to give it to them. Yeah. I mean, and that that's really what it came down to. And it was a matter of still, but also not giving in to immediate gratification and giving it to them all at once, right. because that was when the audience was really starting to respond. That was that was the moment that really marked. Even though, for for from your perspective, from Vince's perspective. The, uh, the moment that put Austin on the map was when he put the headsets on for the first time. Yep. For the fans, that promo at the end of King of the Ring, and, ri- and winning King of the Ring is what put him on the map. And then what solidified it was, it was either the next pay-per-view or two pay-per-views later when he had the match with Brett. And in the, one, in the course of one match, and I remember watching this as a fan and just completely being blown away by the psychology because also I was wrestling at the time and I was very much into the psychology. In one match... Essentially, turning Brett heel and turning Austin face yep. in one turn match, yeah. which th- was to me perfection but, as far as execution. But I also think, I mean, we have to call a spade a spade, and I mean, I, I'm convinced. I mean, and as as over as Austin three sixteen was, and you know, I mean, for everything he was and he represented, I mean, I'll I'll be the first to say he would have never ever. You know, reach the the the, the movie star sat status that he did without the Vince McMahon character. Yes, yes. I mean, yes. I, you've I, got to have I, a great I, foil. I, I'm, I'm sorry. He he would have he would have hit a certain level, but without that character to play off. Hands and, down. and you know, let, let me tell you something. That that's what people don't understand. You had two of the best in the history of this business, yep. working an angle based on reality. Yep. The blue collar worker, the white collar boss, yep. that that affected and touched every. I don't care how long we're alive. I don't care how long the wrestling business exists. You will never, ever, ever see chemistry like that again. And you'll it, never it see pops happen. in the crowd at that level. If you watch the never. Monday Night War DVD never. and you see that footage and you compare it to what you see now uh, for the most popular baby face. Out never there. happened. The, no. I, the intensity of emotion <laughs> and feeling and bond that those fans had with Austin when that glass broke and he came to the ring and he just had a way about him. But the thing is, it too, we, which we got, we, we've got to, you know, you've got to give credit was Vince in his role was every bit as good as yep. Austin was in his. And, and part of what made that work is that Vince, it was such, it's where the Hogan turn came out of nowhere in WCW. The Vince turn, not that it came out of nowhere, but there was such a multi-decade history well, of because him the being fans the street man. The fans knew him. He had been around forever. They knew him. They felt like they knew him. And also, as a fan, you knew he was the owner of the company. Yep. But yet, this was the first time that was being used yep. in the story. But lines. you know what, too, you got to give Vince credit for, and very few are able to do this. And, and every time I see not only a wrestler do it, but every time I see you know an actress do it or an actor do it, I mean, I'm I'm really I'm really taken by them. I'm I'm really taken by people or actors and act- actresses that are able to laugh at themselves. Yep. Now, the thing that amazed me here was Vince McMahon probably has w- one of the top three biggest egos on this planet. It's probably <laughs> Vince, Donald Trump, and uh, throw whoever you want in there as a third. Play the guy's got a huge ego, yeah. you know, the body and, you know, the whole nine yards. But the bottom line was for business purposes, for show purposes, for all the right reasons, he goes out in the rain, he wets his pants. And gets yeah. just humiliated. Yeah. Yep. Now, you see, you, you've got to give him all the credit in the world for that because, you know, 
he, he was smart enough to realize what he had to do, yeah. you know, in order to make this thing go. That through this also field, comes. You know? to, that comes to a lot of that is him being in this business as long, being this business for as long as he had been, knowing how to be an effective heel and how to show your ass as a heel, but still keep your heat. Mm -hmm. And that Vince was, there was never anybody better about that because Vince could show his ass one week and then the following week have ten times more heat on himself. Mm -hmm. And that's and, that's something Ric Flair was great at too. Yes, in his day, absolutely. Ric Flair would get humiliated. The term show your ass, it means mm -hmm. humiliate yourself so the fans laugh yeah. at you. Yes. And then the next show, you are back on top of the world and you're pretending that didn't happen and the fans are so angry because they thought they finally got to you and they didn't. You're still on top of the mountain. Flair did that. Vince did that. Good heels do that. Yep. And, and you're right. He was so good at that. What, what was Austin like behind the scenes working with him during the whole stretch? Did he change as he got famous? Um, as he was injured? Did that change his whole persona? Was he a likable person behind the scenes? Talk about Austin, the person. Okay. Austin behind the scenes. Um... Well, you knew him earlier than I did. I came in, the uh, the King of the Ring, I came in one year to the day after he won the King of the Ring, and that was the beginning of the whole the whole McMahon-Austin storyline building up. Because that was, that was a gradual progression because it didn't become Austin McMahon right off the bat. So um, maybe you can speak to what he was like from the beginning. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because the day he won the title, we were at the, the television the next day, and, and I remember Vince saying to me, you're with Austin 24-7. I, I don't care about anybody else. You stay with him 24-7. And, and I remember... Was this the, the WrestleMania? When, when, the, when he won the title? No. Nah, he lost WrestleMania. He lost... With, the, that, with Tyson? When, oh, no. But when he, yeah, when he lost to Bret Hart, that was when he became a star. And he right. became a big star by losing, which is yeah. great. Right. But then when he won the title, then you're saying yeah. Vince knew he had it. That was it. Vince said, Vince, nobody else. You know, yeah. it's all about Austin, all about Austin, all about Austin. Stay with him, stay with him, stay with him. And the one thing I saw a, as time progressed that was sad, okay, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, this is, not, this is not a reflection on Steve, this is a reflection, I think, on how any human being would have reacted under those circumstances, also including the myself, and the business. But what happened was the success with the Stone Cold Steve Austin character came so fast <clears throat> and so hard and so overwhelming and and keeping in mind the picture you painted leading up to that getting yep. fired at WCW EC, the whole progression now the success came so fast and so furious that in this is only my opinion in working with them a, a, a certain amount of paranoia set in mm -hmm. and I think that paranoia set in because Steve was scared to death that this can end just as quickly as it began. And because there was a reason to be paranoid, because Vince McMahon had a history of trying to make sure nobody got too much power because he had been burned before. And Austin <coughs> felt, and probably to a certain extent it was true, there were forces working against him because he had too much power, be it other wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. Vince, just try to keep him in check a little bit. There was a big boss man, something with boss man that happened once on TV where Austin felt it was done to put him in a bad position to show, see the production people have the power to make you look good or bad. And that's where I think he started. So much was going on that he felt, you know what, there are forces working against me. Plus too, it was also coming from the WCW backstage, which yep. I'm sure we'll get to, but which was very different from the WWF right. locker but room. But you know what, I, 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 I also gotta be honest here, and you know, <coughs> excuse me. maybe I'm naive, maybe I, I wasn't, but I, I've gotta be honest with you, in working that closely to the situation, I, I never saw Vince portray that. Yeah. I mean, I, I never, I, I've seen Vince do that with other people. Yeah. But I mean, with Austin, it was, the pedal was to the metal, man. Yeah. And I mean, he, I, 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 I don't think Vince was concerned. I mean, it was yeah. money. Yeah. It was money, and he knew it was money, and he knew it was on the right track. And, you know, we were going to the moon with this thing. But unfortunately, like I said, I, I think there was just this feeling of it could all end tomorrow. Yeah. So you could see as the weeks grew by, as his popularity was growing, he became more and more paranoid. Whereas now you're trying to write a, you're, you're trying to write a promo. You're trying to write a storyline. You're trying to put him, and it was very difficult because you're always trying to put him in a unique situation. Yeah, trying to do something new but, every but, time but, but so it now, didn't get yeah, stale. But now he was looking at it like 
is this going to hurt me? Are, are they trying to hurt me? And, and it almost got to the point that he would poke holes in things until he found, finally found something. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. he wasn't satisfied until he found something. Did, did he and, do this respectfully, or was it to the point where he had so much power it was almost difficult to work with him, or was it he's paranoid but polite? Paranoid but polite. Okay. He, he, I, I, Steve was never difficult to work with. I yep. mean, he, I, 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 he was never difficult to work with, but the, the paranoia became a problem because, you know, I mean, I know me personally, every week I was trying to put him in different, unique situations and really, you know, rattling my brain to come up with that, but he was always just so defensive and always trying to think that I was working the other way, you know, and, and, and after a while, you know, that, that, that just became a little difficult. And how was Steve with other wrestlers? Was he well-liked? Was he one of the boys, so to speak, playing pool and yeah. popular? Or did he separate himself and kind of go off to the side? It's interesting because there were, there, were, there were aspects of Steve's personality where he kept to himself. Yeah. Um, but as far in general, he was one of the boys. He loved hanging around, laughing with the guys, pulling ribs, just having a good time in general backstage. But you could see... The more that that, you know, the again, weight in my fame. opinion, the weight of the fame and the paranoia that, that it seemed to be kind of took hold in him, he kind of, you know, he still was one of the boys, but yet he spent more time by himself because yeah. he spent more time trying to figure out, well, what am I doing? What do I need to do? Am I doing the right thing? And going with what Vince was saying before, again, a lot of what he came to, 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 to have problems with was, uh, you know, because, again, we were trying every week to do something bigger, better, fresher, newer, because that was the whole thing about Steve's character. Was, I, let let it me was just so interrupt new. for a second because I'll give you the perfect example while I it just said this. And this is a perfect example. I'll never forget, and I don't know if you were there or not, where we, I, I came up with the idea, and I don't think you were there because I, I, I think I came up with the idea, but when he drove in the beer truck. Mm -hmm. And I'll never no, forget. I was there. Oh, were you there? But oh, dude. I'll, I'll you're never gonna, forget. You're going to interrupt me and then I'm say sorry, I wasn't bro. there? I'm sorry. <laughs> you got to interrupt but, me. No, but he, here's the deal. I'll never forget when, when we came up with him driving in the beer truck. Yeah. And Ed and I are trying to figure out the logistics of this thing. I'll never forget. I was so excited to bring this to him. Steve, you're going to drive a beer truck. Yeah. I'll never forget. I, I, I laid this out to him, and I, I was so excited about it. And he looked at me, and he said to me, why can't I just drive in my pickup? And I, but that's and this what I mean. After that, that, we had done the Zamboni. Right, that, that's what yeah. I mean. I was like, Steve, a, a beer truck. Yeah. I mean, you know, but see, that's what I mean. It, yeah. it, it would get to the point of, you know, him kind of looking at us in the corner of his eye, okay, what, what are these guys trying to do here? Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, and, and that was really sad because we were on his side, you know? Yeah. Well, the thing is, the more, yeah. that, the more that we did with him, the, be the, the better that the show did. Right. The more interesting right. stuff yeah. we did, the better the show did. So, I mean, that was it was a shame that we had to have those problems to do it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it seemed to work out okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think people know who he is. Yeah. Vince, since you've been out of WWF, and when you were gone, a lot of people have said, wasn't that influential. One of the things that they hear is scripting of interviews. And there's been different points of view on how much word for word or talking point for talking point, ideas were presented to Steve Austin, to The Rock, to some of the wrestlers. Was there a difference? Were undercard guys scripted almost word for word? Were top guys given more leeway? How did that work? What is the, the, the truth on how that scripting worked out? It, it just depends on the individual. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that, that, that's really what it came down to. You, you work so much with this talent, you knew who could do what. Yeah. And, you know, a lot, a lot of it was, um, you know, some guys became, you know, started with heavy scripting. And then, you know, you kind of wean them off it. Okay. Some guys needed a lot of scripting at the beginning just because of the character, like Goldust or Val Venus. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, we, we had to script that to create the character. Yep. But th that really is more of, a, of, of the, uh, the personality that you're dealing Plus with. Plus, also, some guys pr preferred it. Right. Like, right. like Jeff. Right. Jeff Jarrett oh, yeah. was to a guy, day, to that. this day, yeah. Jeff Jarrett was a guy who he wants you to write it out and he goes off and I don't know how he does it but incredibly quickly memorizes it word for word okay. and he delivers it and but there are other guys like Austin who would just want he would say what are my bullet points yep what are my bullet points and he would make sure and he would he would nail them but a lot of that too a lot of that was real important at the beginning when you're when you're um Defining the character. character. Like, okay. I mean, I, I remember when uh, when uh, Triple H was just starting with DX. I mean, I 
probably wrote every word that came out of his mouth yeah. because it's just vital at the beginning stages. But you know, week by week by week by week, as they get into the character, you, you know, they wean off of it. Besides Steve Austin, The Rock was probably if you had to pick two people out, without question, the other person who contributed to WWE being so hot for that stretch of time in the late 90s. Talk about the form, the beginning of Rock. He's in the Nation of Domination, a group of wrestlers, and everyone's kind of noticing there's something special about him. Even though, as a babyface, as a good guy, he was booed by fans, and people were saying he's never going to be anything. He's too smiley and happy. He gets an NOD, he gets an attitude, and he starts getting noticed. How did he end up being pulled aside and getting a push as a top star? Who noticed it? How did that happen? Listening to the crowds. Yeah. The crowds were responding to yeah. him. Well, you know, the thing is, um, that that was another deal where, um, uh, you, were you, you there at the very beginning? Not the baby face. I came in NOD, and that was... It, it, when that that was another up. thing where, you know, uh, <clears throat> he, he was rocking my via. It, yeah. it, it was horrible. With a fun that was a, And that was a perfect example right. of, they'll eat what we feed them. They'll eat what yep. we feed them. He, he got hurt. And then... Um, you know, I'll give credit where credit is due. You know, I was writing the TV at the time, and, and Bruce Pritchard actually said to me, um, when Rock gets healthy, and, you know, why don't we put him in the Nation of Domination, mm -hmm. NOD? And, 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 I mean, I didn't see it, you know, and I, he put, we had nothing to lose. Yeah. I was like, what the heck, you know? We, we, he was getting healthy, we had to find a spot for him. Yep. So we put him, you know, went with the Nation of Domination, and, of course, um, uh, Farouk, uh, you know, was, was the main character at the time. And I just remember just watching Rock in the background and, and watching his eyes and watching his mannerisms. And again... He stole the scene. Yes. The, it's the Steve Austin song. Yep. yep. It's it, the, the same thing, you know? And people started reacting, people started reacting. And I'll never forget this. As I'm watching him, I, I keep... From somewhere, I was getting this vision of the rock in the third person, the rock this, the rock that, the rock this. But what kept me from going anywhere with it was I was a huge Don Morocco fan. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I kept thinking that this is, it, it's too disrespectful to Don Morocco. Who was known as Don the Rock. The Rock, Morocco. you know, and that's all I could think about. But finally, you know, I, I'll never forget it. It was, we, we were at Monday Night Raw. And, and I went up to him, you know, and at that time it was Dwayne. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, Dwayne, I said, th th there's just something that's with me, and, and, and I want to share this with you. And, I, and he goes, what? I said, why don't you just try to go out there and refer to yourself as the, in the third person? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, everything you say, it's the rock says this, the rock says that, the rock said the rock, the rock, the rock, the rock. And he just looked at me, he goes, okay, I'll try it. And yeah. it was, he, I mean, he literally was going out in, in, in a half an hour. Yeah. So, you know, it's again, it's a Steve Austin moment. He went out there and started referring to himself as The Rock. And I'm sitting in the back and I'm saying... It. Yep, <laughs> I remember seeing the same thing and thinking the same I, I, thing. I'm telling, but but again, let's yep. make one thing perfectly clear, okay? It was all him. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yep. the, you, I, I could have said those words to 50 other guys. Yep. It was all him. And, and let me tell you the one thing about The Rock where... I've said this, and I'll, I'll say it again. I don't think there's going to be another star in the history of this business that is bigger than The Rock. And the reason being, in my opinion, the thing that was so much different about him, you know, people have charisma, people have good looks, people have all these things. Yeah. But the thing that was different about him was <laughs> he was so much smarter than everybody else. Mm -hmm. He had he had such an intelligence yep. level, nobody could touch him. I mean, the conversations I used to have with him and what was going through his mind, he was just so much smarter than everybody else. And that's why I believe you, you're never going to find another individual that has just all those gifts and is able to take all these gifts and just, you know, go out and, and do what he does. And it's just another scenario like Austin man all the credit goes to him yeah. because he was smart enough to be able to pull it off Ed was there a downside to working with Rock did he get a big head was he ever full of himself did he ever go I am smarter than everyone else and kind of take on an air of superiority around people actually uh, no and it's without hesitation I yep. say that Rock is I mean because I think I believe because of that intelligence yep. that fierce intelligence that he had 
and he would analyze everything, but not in a, in like the way that we talked about with Steve. Yeah. He would analyze everything and try and see how to improve it. What yeah. can I add to it, as opposed to what? Won't very but, but the difference between the two, yeah. and again, a lot of it had to do with how they got there. The difference between the two was the confidence. Mm. Rock, Rock knew he was better than everybody right. else. Yep. He, he didn't and care he, about politics. He, he knew he, he hadn't was been let go from else. WCW. That's right. He had, right. you know, right. just he had been. He, yep. But he did have a lame gimmick slapped he on. Got, yeah, right. he went through from a day one. one. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, Rock also supremely he confident. Had, he yes. was very confident, yes. but not arrogant. No, yep. no and not no, cocky. No, never, just no. confident, sure of himself. And I mean, he was always so easy to work with. He was such a pleasure to work with because. It was literally working together and working, you know, with him to get the best we could out of him. Is it safe to say you looked forward to working with Rock more than Austin just because it was more of a It was it was less of a tug of war. Okay. Yep. There, with Austin, it was always it was always ultimately at the end of the day, it was all for the best, you know, in the in the best interest of the product. Yeah. And Austin, like like Vince said, polite Yet he could be very stubborn, and it was like a tug, yeah. tug the, of war. The, the but rock, right? The frustration with easier. Steve was, Steve, we're not trying to hurt you. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're on your team. We yeah. want to get this to the next level, and, and and that was the frustration. But you know, again, to me, the amazing thing with Rock was. Um, the whole time, you know, from Rocky My V or at Madison Square Garden to the last day I left, it was the same guy, man. Yeah. It yeah. was not the same one guy, yeah. was and he was respectful with everybody right. yeah. from right. top to bottom. Yeah. And, and was Austin respectful of the little guy behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, yeah. he, he yeah. very much yeah. was. Yeah. But I mean, when you think of a guy at the level, I mean, because even, especially now, at this point, with The Rock's career blowing up in Hollywood yeah. and all that, he's gone even further <clears throat> than Steve did. Yeah. And But there was no, not even the slightest inkling of that. How did Steve and Rock get along? Was there professional jealousy? Was there respect? Did they hit it off personally? Did they keep their distance? What was going on between them? Because Austin was first, mm -hmm. and then Rock comes along, and Austin's no longer Hulk Hogan, and then everybody else. Now it's Austin and Rock, and everybody else. How did that? How did that work? I I, I think, it, and, and again, this is just my opinion. I I think there might have been a touch of jealousy on Austin's part, but it never affected his no. professionalism yeah. at all. Yeah. Never, never. I'm not doing the job. Never, because I'm not. Never. Austin never. had what Hogan didn't have, right. which was a Larry Bird or the Magic Johnson. Right. That, mm -hmm. And that, I think, helped both of them. And as much as maybe they will, each might, might have rather been in Hogan's spot, it's Hogan and everybody else, in a sense, they also would appreciate that they had each other to work but off it, of. But again, yeah. uh, w w with Austin, too, Austin was smart enough, and, and, and Ed kind of just hit, hit on him. He was the same to everybody from top to bottom, and him working with Rock was business and it would make him more money. Right. And, and, and he Steve, knew that. Steve was always smart enough to know that. He yep. would do whatever was right for business, including the Shawn Michaels match. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a catastrophe, but business. And, and I mean, Steve always was business. He always was. What, talk about the catastrophe. What was a catastrophe? Oh, boy, man. I could tell you stories till 3 o'clock in the morning, man. It's <laughs> at, at the time of the Austin and, and Sean match, Vince and Sean were not talking. And I was the middleman. Yeah. And I used to get from Sean, go tell Vince this, go tell Vince that, go tell Vince this. And at the time, poor Hunter was stuck in the middle of it mm -hmm. because he was part of DX. But man, at, at that time, you know, Sean was at just such a bad place, man. Yeah. And he'd be the first one to tell you yeah. today. It's all on record. He's there's talking no, about no, no yeah. question about it. But he was at such a bad place. But there's one thing I want to say is we, we talk about Austin and we talk about Rock. And, you know, I, I've talked about this in my book. To me, the most talented performer I ever worked with was Shawn Michaels. O overall or in the ring? Or overall. Every, every, overall. Yep. Because Shawn didn't have the gifts of rock. Yep. He didn't have the gifts rock had. But when it came to being a star, yep. I mean, to this day, I, I, I'll still say he was the, he, you know, he, he was the biggest star that, that, that I ever worked with. And, and I had such a a love-hate relationship with Sean. I mean, I, th that's a guy that I wrote a lot of his stuff. Yeah. And, you know, he would come to me a lot, but it, a lot of it was love and hate. A, a lot of it, I mean, and, and I'm sure he'd be the first to say it, you know, there were some drugs involved, yep. so you weren't always, you know, working with... You didn't know what Sean would show up. You didn't know what Sean would, show, didn't up. Know what yeah. Sean would yeah. show up. But, I mean, as far as talent, I mean, I, I just, to this day, I think the guy's incredible. Now, DX... 
Triple H, the rise of Triple H. He's this third element in the boom period of WWF. Mm -hmm. Steve Austin and The Rock, mutual respect. They became big stars at about the same time. You know, I mean, there's, you know, Austin first. But then Hunter's trying to figure out where do I fit in. You've got Austin with his injuries. You've got Rock with a movie career that gave Hunter some options. What was Hunter like in the formative stages, and did he seem driven to be one of the top guys? Was he just happy to be a, a second-tier guy who got lucked into a top spot? What was he like early on? Because now we know he's the top dog, but what was he like when Rock and Austin were around? He was absolutely driven. Yeah. I mean, Hunter, Hunter, but again, Hunter was one of the hardest working guys in that company. Hunter knew that Austin was here and Rock was here and Hunter was here. And Hunter knew that he wanted to be there and he knew that one day he would be there. But he was not, you know, he didn't rest for a second. He was tireless. And he, again, I would put him more in the Austin camp in terms of just poking poking holes at everything and looking, scrutinizing everything because, yeah. again, he was looking at it as, I'm not there and I don't want the slightest misstep yeah. to keep me from getting there a second later than I should be get, than I should be arriving. Yeah. Um, and they both... He was hungry. He yeah. was... He was rabid hungry. Yeah. And he was great to work with because he... If he took something, he would run with it and make it gold. The thing about... The thing about uh, Hunter and... and, and, and you know, I, I've said this before. Is, you know, I, I got two small boys, and and if I if I ever wanted to teach them a lesson on just, you know, dedication and hard work, Hunter would definitely be the example. And and it, it, the reason why I'm jumping in is because you weren't here for this, but mm -hmm. you know when the You're sure the, the, <laughs> yes the last you, time you know when, I when, was. when I'll never forget when the tragedy went down at Madison Square Garden. Okay, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. The right? curtain call. The curtain call, and I'll never forget. I, I was, was there. Which which is no, it really wasn't. Right. No, which wasn't. which it should be noted is how Steve Austin got his break. Triple H talks about that in the book, yes. where Hunter was scheduled to win the King of the Ring. Right. He screwed up, but Austin gets a chance. Which, which is my point. I'll yeah. never forget. Uh, you know, I went to the booking meeting the next day. This is when I was the odd man out, mm -hmm. and man, it, it 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 was like somebody shot somebody's grandmother. <laughs> I mean, it was like it was and the end I, of the world. I was so entertained <laughs> by they thought the business was dead they, yep. the, it, from this day because forward. Because MSG is a center of Vince McMahon's yeah, universe. Yes. It always yeah. will be. But man, I'll never forget it. And let, let's let let let's think about the consequences. Sean at the time was the champion. Yep. Not okay. Do to him. Hall and Nash were on their way out. Mm -hmm. There was one guy. Yep. And when I tell you, I was there firsthand when they tortured him. Mm -hmm. They absolutely. And I remember going in in locker rooms when he'd be by himself, and I'd say, Hunter, hang in there. You've got to hang in there. You 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 know the game. You know what they're going to do. You got to hang in there. And they tortured him, and they buried him, and they beat him, and they tortured him some more. The the, the wrestling games yep. that I hate so much that made Steve that have historically been done, yes. and is where Steve Austin is coming from. Yes. Even though he it maybe wasn't happening as much as he thought. Yes. The Hunter example yes. shows where Austin got that paranoia from. But right? you talk about a guy rising above it all. You know what? It it, it personally hurts me. When I, I hear people talk about Triple H today, and I, I haven't spoken to Hunter since I left, yeah. but it personally hurts me when I hear it because I worked with the guy for almost three years. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't believe for one minute that the Hunter today is the guy that people are telling me is, if anything's changed Hunter, it's the business. Mm -hmm. It's not Hunter, because when you talk about heart, n nobody could touch him. I mean, no, nobody could touch him. Speaking of heart, that's a lame transition. Bret Hart, Survivor Series. We've got to talk about that. Go ahead and talk about it. I'm not even going to get specific. What do you? What is your impression going back and kind of create your involvement or your your impression it, it, of what happened? It, 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 it's a real long story. Yeah. I mean, it, and we don't need everybody knows the details. That's the good part about this story. We don't have to recount it in detail. But are you are you were you in favor of what happened at the time? And do you look at it differently now? This, it, it, it's a very long story, and, and I don't want to sit here and plug my book, but I'm going to because th every detail is, yeah. is in my book when yeah. it comes out. And th there's stuff that people don't know. You could do two hours on it. Right? Absolutely, really but there is stuff that people don't know because I was right smack in the middle of it. But I will tell you this, okay? A and I will share something with you, and I don't even know if you're aware of this, but I understood completely 100% why Vince did what he did. A a and to this day, I stand behind him 100%. What's something that people don't know who are on Brett's side of this and think Vince did a horrible thing. What's what's a fact that, or an instance that kind of 
makes you feel differently? There, 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 there's a couple of things. Number one, Vince did everything in his power to come up with an alternate finish. Yep. Everything and had everybody involved. That, that's number one. Number two, the, the question was never not trusting Brett. The question was not trusting Eric Bischoff. Yep. Okay, and all Vince was trying to do was protect his company and everybody in it. That, that's all he was trying to do. Oh, okay, I'll take devil's advocate of you. Why lie to Brett? Why did Vince have to tell Brett at some point within 24, 48 hours of that match, Brett, I'm agreeing with you, looked him in the eye, what you are now proposing is fine with me, we'll go with that plan. And after all Brett did for that company, okay. Vince went Well, because I, I can tell you, leading up to that, you know, at least a week leading up to that, Vince exhausted every possible scenario he could probably exhaust. Yeah. Brett shot everything Brett down. Brett shot everything yeah. down. And, and I, I don't want to just say shot everything down, didn't want to hear it. He wasn't losing to Sean. Yeah. In Canada. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Okay? Cut and dry. And, and, and I was there firsthand to, to, to know the ideas and know everything Vince threw at him. Brett wasn't doing it, again, because of the history between him and Sean. Yeah. You know? But um, what it came down to was not trusting Eric Bischoff. Yeah. If, if Eric Bischoff would have went out on Monday Night Show the next day with, with Vince's belt, yeah. Vince was not going to allow that to happen. Yeah. So I will say Brett gave Vince no other choice but to lie right to his face. Yeah. And Vince did what he had to do for his company and everybody in it, and, and I was a part of it at the time. You know, Did it hurt Vince to do what he did, or was he so worked up by Brett's stubbornness it, 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 it and ripped, it, ripped, it ripped his heart out. Yeah. It, it, it ripped his heart out to do what he had to do. There's, there's no question in my mind. After the incident, Vince walked into Brett's locker room to get what he had coming, mm -hmm. because he knew what he did but he also knew he had no choice. But he, it, it ripped his heart out to, to do it. Do you think that Bret Hart took himself and his hero image in Canada so seriously, too seriously, that it made it actually difficult to reason with him? I, I, you know, it, it's funny because there were people at the time in the WWF that were laughing at Bret. Yeah. I mean, no question about it. Yeah. And, and the funny thing about it is he took it very seriously. But the funny thing about it is I, I can look back now and I want somebody to tell me, okay, in the last five years or even the last ten years in this business, who has been even close to being a hero in the wrestling business? Mm -hmm. When you look at it today, Bret Hart was truly a hero. But how did losing to Shawn Michaels in Canada change that? It, it wouldn't. It was more. Per that's where he used the hero excuse as a reason to not do a job to somebody who he despised. And that's. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it's not that he didn't want to lose in Canada because he was a hero. He didn't want to lose to Shawn Michaels because of what Brett knew Shawn Michaels represented to him. That's where I say is he taking things too seriously. I mean, I, I, I tell you what. I don't think he was taking things too seriously because it meant that much to him. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 the moniker meant that much to him. And, you know, like I said, there are a lot of people that laughed at him. But I look back now and I'm like, Brett was a hero. Yeah. I mean, he, he really and honestly, truly was a hero. And th th when you look at the business today, th there's nobody like Bret Hart. I mean, I, I really believe that, you know, he stands tall and, and, and he stands out perhaps more than anybody, you know, in the last five to ten years. I mean, I really believe that. But one thing I, I'll say, let me go, come at it from the other direction. I agree with you, Brett being a hero.